So if I look back to the time before Marmaduke and afterwards, I probably had a conventional life and it was probably accompanied by the same sort of fears and anxiety that everybody else has. I think a lot of day-to-day -day cares and anxiety and fears got in the way of good living. And it's not just the loss of somebody that changes your perspective. I think just the richness of the journey, that understanding of what happens when you're present, what that uncovers for both of you, because you both gain something from it, changed my life. It's an odd one talking about group because a lot of people um, don't get it. Well, I remember when Marmaduke died, I had a degree of acceptance around that. I know a number of friends found that challenging. But I think it's interwoven with that sense of gratitude in that um, it meant I could celebrate the stunning relationship that we had, that amazing opportunity to share a journey with a son who was so full of life. We just focused on each day and each moment actually. It sometimes came down to each five minutes, um, particularly towards the end of his life. I do remember a gut-wrenching fear. There was a stage when the worst possible thought was that he wouldn't be cured. And then very quickly, he became terminal. And so then you're juggling, he's dying. But you don't know when, you don't know how necessarily. And so by the time you realize the treatment isn't going to work, you've almost accepted, right, it's going to be terminal from here. And my focus then was very much, what does he need? When you're so present, um, so much joy is available to both of you as a result that you have amazing gratitude for that relationship. And so even though he died and we lost him, perhaps I choose not to dwell on the loss. And that sense of gratitude comes up so naturally because I just fill with joy and smiles when I think of him because of that amazing connection that we had and what we shared and we were open to it and we didn't block it and we didn't let fear get in the way and we didn't bury ourselves in the past thinking about what we'd lost and we didn't bury ourselves in the future in terms of denial thinking about oh it's going to be okay it's, we actually just accepted what was happening and tried to get the most out of each day that was given to us and those days became weeks, became months, so it was actually a beautiful journey. That amazing environment, that cocoon of love that we created around him, meant that we had a beautiful series of weeks um, as he declined. So I think that processing of grief is highly individual. And I think where there's a long medical journey, it may, it may happen slowly over time. That possibly meant I was better able to feel the gratitude and acceptance when he died. Um, because I'd been processing this for so long. Oh, well, down by the river, the, the rainforest, it's just a beautiful spot. I remember when I was living in the, literally living in the hospital, sort of three out of every four weeks, sometimes you wouldn't get out for like 10 days or sometimes you'd be in for a long time. I might race out, get the boys and we'd come down here. Because just being near the water and the sound of water is so grounding. You can decompress and just breathe. And if you're quiet, it's amazing what you see. It was a continuation of being present. And some of my beautiful memories, just standing by the river, just in silence, nobody around. And then there'll be a flash and this amazing indigenous fish would jump. It was, it was a necessary part of my self-care. I was going to say used to be, it is a place of solace. It's very grounding, it's very healing, nurturing coming to the river and it's full of life. I think also nature has been really important for the recovery. Once the children were going through um, sort of the grief and trauma, the recovery afterwards to bring them into nature, we'd go camping or we'd come to the river. Oh, the imagination runs free, the sounds, there's wildlife. 
there's beautiful smells, sunlight. There are so many things to help the senses and it's just incredibly rewarding and really nurturing. The strongest memory when I'm sitting here is actually the big smile on Marmaduke's face when he was down here with his brothers and mum and we were sitting on a, ta a picnic table just like this um, over under the trees and we had some food and then he was just laughing and exploring and just in his element. I think gratitude if I look back, it's not something I sought, it's something that developed. It's funny when I look back, I, I, I might say, oh, the way we chose to be with Marmaduke, but in a way I think it's the way he chose to be with us. He was so mischievous, but so alive. He demanded my presence, so I had to be focused on him and you become everything from nurse to clown. Because when you're being present with someone who's at end of life, Everything else does just fall to the wayside and it gives you a different type of perspective because suddenly work isn't that important. That email isn't as urgent, that phone call isn't as critical. What's important is those eyes staring up at you and what they need. All the cliches of don't sweat the small stuff, they're all real. <laughs> Go home and hug your children. Go home and hug your partner. I suppose it goes back to um, the French author in The Little Prince. Um, what's truly important is indivisible to the eye. And that's, that was our journey with Marmaduke.